Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. There are really two ways you can study the book of Revelation. You can take it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and that's a very valuable way to study the book. The other way you can study it is look at the big pictures. Look at the large themes in the book of Revelation. And that's what we're doing in this series, Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. We're looking at the big picture, looking at the huge themes of the great controversy between good and evil. You'll be thrilled at this presentation, but let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your book. Thank you so much for the privilege of opening the pages of Scripture and seeing Jesus Christ revealed there in Revelation. As we study, give us a sense of your presence. Move within us and help us to see light penetrating the darkness of our world with the glory of your soon return. In Christ's name, amen. My topic this presentation is Revelation's most amazing discovery. Have you ever had a secret dream, a secret wish, something you've really wanted to do? Maybe it was to go skydiving. You say, not me. You know, not long ago, I talked to a friend, and my friend said, I just went skydiving this week. It was the most awesome experience, the most wonderful experience I've ever had. He did not tempt me with his skydiving experience at all. And it kind of reminded me of a story that I read some time ago. Debbie was a skydiver, very experienced skydiver. And she went with a group on a Sunday afternoon far above the deserts of Arizona skydiving. It was a beautiful day. The sky was blue, not much wind blowing, one of those perfect days for skydiving. She went with her instructor and about five other people. The instructor, knowing Debbie, was very experienced at skydiving, said, Debbie, look, I'm going to jump out first. I want to watch the others jump out of the plane. And then you jump out last. Debbie made her jump. When she went to pull her ripcord for the parachute, for some reason the parachute didn't open. She began going faster and faster and faster in her dive. She hit another diver, knocked her unconscious. Blood was running down her face. She streamed past her instructor, and as she plummeted toward earth, her instructor knew that something was wrong. He saw the blood running down her face. He knew that she would hit the ground in just a few seconds in sudden death. Her instructor, Greg, recognizing there was a disaster in the making, tucked in his arms, folded his legs, and he made a rapid dive, 186 miles an hour. As he sped past Debbie, he reached out and pulled her reserve cord. Her parachute opened, and as it did, she floated down to earth. Now, she was injured, but she would never forget this instructor who saved her life. It was a mid-air rescue. As I think of planet Earth, we too are hurtling toward disaster. We too are hurtling toward the last days of Earth's history, hurtling toward death. And as you look at what's going on in our world, you see terrorism. 
you see death on every hand, a world in serious trouble, a world that is hurtling toward disaster. The moral fabric of society is falling apart. Divorce, immorality, sexual perversion. We're living in a world hurtling toward disaster. Famine, fire, flood, hurricanes, earthquakes, natural disasters on every hand. Would you agree with me that this world needs a mid-air rescue? We need intervention that we cannot find humanly. God has a message, a message to prepare men and women for the last days of Earth's history. Of all the books of the Bible, where do you think you would find God's last day message? What book of the Bible do you think you'd find that in? If you were looking for it, if you were searching for it, you'd look at the last book of the Bible, Re Revelation, that's written for the last generation of men and women to live on planet Earth. Revelation has an end time message, a message to prepare people for the coming of our Lord. Here in the book of Revelation, we discover God's mid-air rescue. Just like Greg rescued Debbie as she was plummeting to disaster after that dive from the plane, so God is getting ready for a mid-air rescue to rescue His children on planet Earth. The book of Revelation speaks of hope. The book of Revelation speaks of a great, bright, glorious tomorrow. Yes, there is trouble ahead. We can't minimize that. Certainly, there's a time of trouble coming that this world has never known before. Certainly, there'll be natural disasters, rising crime and violence. Certainly, the Bible teaches about a mark called the mark of the beast, a time when no man can buy or sell. The Bible talks about a universal death decree. It talks about the economic powers and the religious powers and the civil powers uniting. In this series on Revelation, we will study about those varying events. But beyond that trauma, beyond that tragedy, beyond that difficulty, beyond all of those attempts by Satan to destroy goodness and righteousness on planet Earth, beyond all of that, we will see God has a plan, that there's a bright, glorious tomorrow that God has planned for you and me. Now, God always sends a message to prepare His people for major worldwide events that affect their eternal destiny. That's true down through history. And it would be surprising if God did not have a message for His people today. Down through history, God has sent a message. A loving God invites men and women to be saved before the coming calamity. Let's think about some of those times when crises were facing the world and God sent a message. Think of the days of Noah. The Bible says in Genesis 6 that the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. The Bible says that's in verse 5. In Genesis 6 verse 11, the Bible says that the thoughts of their heart were only evil in the imaginations of their heart continually. God saw the wickedness, the sin of the world in the days of Noah. And so God was going to destroy the world by water, but He sent a man, Noah. Now, it was not God's plan that there would be only one ark. You know, I think a loving God would have liked to have seen a hundred arks, a thousand arks, don't you? Wasn't it God's intent to save all humanity? The reason they weren't saved is not because God didn't send a message to prepare them. The reason they weren't saved is because they didn't heed the message that God sent. God sent a man, Noah, to prepare the world for the flood, a coming disaster. Only a few accepted that message and entered into the ark. The great majority rejected that message. God had a message to prepare for the flood. In the days of Joseph, Pharaoh was going to experience, and all of Egypt in fact, an experience famine. But God sent Joseph with his dream. There'd be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Before the great crisis that was to hit, God was preparing the world, preparing Egypt, Israel, 
the Middle East, to face that crisis, God sent a message. Before the first coming of Christ, did God raise up a messenger before the first coming of Christ? Did He? Who was that? John the Baptist. And John the Baptist preached a message to prepare men and women for the first coming of Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. Wouldn't it be surprising that God would prepare the world in the time of the flood with a message from Noah, that God would send Joseph to prepare for that great famine, that God would raise up John the Baptist for the first coming of Christ, and God would not have a message to prepare people for the second coming of Christ? Would it, that not be surprising? Would that not be shocking? Would that not be certainly something that would be unbelievable? But I have good news for you. God has sent a message to prepare a world for His soon return. And that message is found in the last book of the Bible. That message is found in the book of Revelation. If God has sent a message to prepare a world for the coming of Jesus, do you think it's important to study Revelation? Do you think it's important to look into these prophecies and understand God's message to prepare the world for His soon return? Here in Revelation, we find God's end-time message. That message is in the heart of the book of Revelation. It's found here in Revelation chapter 14. Everything before Revelation 14 leads up to this message, and everything after Revelation 14 grows out of this message. So Revelation 14 is really the summary of the entire book of Revelation. Revelation 14 verse 6, and I saw another angel flying. Now notice the angel doesn't float, he flies. Here's an urgent message in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the eternal gospel that is spoken to the hearts of men and women down through the centuries, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here is a message that leaps across geographical boundaries. Here is a message that bridges all cultures. Here is a message that goes to the ends of the earth. This is not something done in a corner. This is not a message for one denomination. This is a message rather that goes worldwide, a message that covers every nation, kindred, dung, and people. It's beyond denominations. This message is for all humanity everywhere. It's a message for Muslims. It's a message for Hindus. It's a message for Buddhists. It's a message for atheists. It's a message for Christians. It is God's final message to all men and women on earth in earth's last hour and men and women who accept that message, whoever they are, wherever they are, will be prepared for the coming of Jesus. It is as important a message for our day as Noah's message was for his day. Was anybody saved from the flood waters who did not accept Noah's message and get into the ark? Not at all. And does God have an urgent, vital, significant end-time message for today? Indeed. He does. It's a universal message that's to go around the globe rapidly. We would expect then, just before the coming of Jesus, that God would send His message around the globe. It's exciting to me that I can stand here in a little place in Illinois, in southern Illinois, and speak to the world from this place. It's exciting to see that God is using television around the world to share His message, that through internet, God is sharing His message, through radio, God is sharing His message, through literature, God is sharing His message. Totalitarian regimes cannot keep that message from going to the ends of the earth. Repressive governments can't keep that message from going to the ends of the earth. God's message is penetrating the deepest jungles. God's message is penetrating the largest cities. God's message is penetrating the most closed countries because Jesus said that He would send a last day message pictured by angels flying in mid-heaven to go to the ends of the earth. And those prophecies are being fulfilled today. We are living in the time when those prophecies are being fulfilled. Now, what event does this message, this end time message, prepare all humanity for? What event does it prepare them for? Revelation chapter 14 is divided into three parts. First, there is a people that are redeemed by Christ and stand on the sea of glass. Secondly, 
there is a message that prepares those people. That's from Revelation 6 to about Revelation 12. Then there is an event for which they're prepared. Did you get those three things? A people, a what? Message, and an event. Once again, what are they? A people, a message, and an event. So let's look at the event. We find it in Revelation 14. We see it there in Revelation 14, verse 14 to 16. John says, I looked, I gazed in prophetic vision, and beheld a white cloud. And on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, again, kingly authority, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple. And notice what the angel says when he comes out of the temple. The angel cries with a loud voice. What kind of voice, everybody? A loud voice. Why a loud voice? So all humanity can hear it. The angel says with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is what? Ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now when the Bible uses the symbol of harvest, what does that mean? In the book of Revelation, we don't have to guess what symbolism means. Because as we look at Revelation, in other parts of the Bible, the symbols are explained. And so when the Bible uses the term harvest, how is that explained? You remember Jesus told a parable about the harvest, and this explains the meaning of Revelation's symbol of harvest. Remember Jesus said there was a field, and the farmer sowed good seed, and there were wheat and tares in the field, and then Jesus talked that the harvest would come, and then Christ puts it this way. Matthew chapter 13, verse 39, the enemy, who's the enemy? That's the devil. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is what? The end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Now, how do you know the harvest is the end of the age? You know that because I told you, right? No, you know that because of what? The Bible says it. Jesus says the harvest is the end of the age. So when the book of Revelation chapter 14 talks about the final harvest, it's talking about the end of the age. It's talking about the time that Jesus Christ will come the time that the destinies of all humanity would be settled, the time that Christ would come and the righteous would be resurrected, the righteous living would be changed, and along with the righteous who are resurrected and changed, would be caught up to meet Christ in the sky, the time that Christ would come when the wicked would be destroyed by the brightness of His coming. There is a message, an eternal message, a universal message, a global message that would prepare men and women for that event of the coming of Christ. The reign of sin will come to an end. Jesus will be victorious and glorious. He will reign forever and ever. But what is that message? That message that must go to all humanity. That message that must go to the ends of the earth. That unique message like Noah's day to prepare a world for the coming of Christ. Let's study that message phrase by phrase. Understanding that message means eternal life. Then I saw another angel flying urgently in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Let's pause for a moment. Let's not pass over that phrase, everlasting gospel, quickly. What is the everlasting gospel? The everlasting gospel is defined for us in Scripture. It is about the, the death, the, the resurrection, the priestly ministry in the coming of our Lord. The Apostle Paul talks about the everlasting gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. And he says this, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture and that he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So what is the everlasting gospel? First, Christ died for our sins. The fact that through Jesus Christ and his shed blood and because of his grace, you and I can find peace just last evening. I got a message from my web page. It was a short message, message from a young man and he said something like this. 
He said, life for me is not worth living. Can you call me, Pastor? Because I want to know how to find Jesus Christ. I don't have any peace in my life and any purpose in my life. There is one way that we can have peace. One of the reasons we don't have peace often is because guilt strangles that peace. One of the reasons we don't have peace is because the condemning voices in our head say you failed. You're not worth very much. There's no hope for you. One of the reasons we don't have peace is because we don't have purpose and meaning in our lives. But coming to Jesus, we find one who forgives us, one whose arms are wide open for us, one who gives us grace, one who died for us so that our guilt could be gone, one who assures us of the gift of eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says this. It says, this is the confidence that we have in Him. In the book of John, it says, and I've written these things that you may know that you have eternal life because his, this life is in His Son. When we accept Jesus, He gives us the gift of eternal life. We can find peace again. What is the gospel? Our faith depends on what Christ did for us, not what we do for ourselves. You see, it's not that we can do enough good works to be saved. It's not, look how righteous and great that I am. It's rather, this is what Christ has done for me. And what's the essence of Christianity? It's kneeling at Jesus' feet. It's saying, Lord, I am yours. I accept your sacrifice for me. I accept your death on my behalf. I accept your perfect life makes up for my imperfection. I want to live for Christ. For me to live is Christ. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 16, when he's talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus has no peace. He has all the external trappings of religion, the formal ritualistic religion, that Jewish background. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not, what everybody? Perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Here is the good news. Here is Christ's message for a final generation. You need not perish. You can live and live forever. The grave need not be a dark hole in the ground. Death need not be a long night without a morning. You need not perish, Jesus says. You can have everlasting life. What is, the, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Christ died, but it's also the good news that He lived a perfect life. Jesus resisted every temptation of the Father, of, of, the, of the devil, by the strength of the Father. Jesus resisted every temptation of the evil one, every thing that was thrown at Christ by the devil. Jesus resisted. He lived a perfect life. What difference does that make? It really makes two differences. Number one, that the perfect life that he lived atones for, makes up for our imperfect lives. But secondly, it also makes this difference. If Jesus, through the dependence on the Father, if Jesus, through divine strength, could be an overcomer, Revelation says, you and I can also be overcomers. In the message to the seven churches, they all end with the same phrase, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. You and I need not be strangled by sin anymore. Christ's perfect life record is put in the place of our sinful records. It's put in the place of the sinful records of all who accept him. We come to Jesus just as we are. We don't have to wait until we have some kind of super perfection. We come to Jesus just as we are, but we don't stay as we are. He comes into our, our lives by His grace, by His divine power. He changes us, makes us new again. The everlasting gospel, Christ died for us. Christ lived for us. Christ rose from the dead for us. Christ indeed is alive. And because He is alive, we can come. And His power can change our lives. He can make us over again. He can give us new purpose and meaning in life. Christ ascended to the Father. He is there before the throne of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse, verse 15, Let us come boldly or confidently to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace 
in time a need? Do you have some time a need? Going through some challenge in your life, Revelation's end time message is you're not alone. That through Jesus' power and by His grace, you can be a changed man. You can be a changed woman. You can be a new person. The great leaders of this world have lived and died, and they're in their grave. Stalin in his grave. Chairman Mao in his grave. Napoleon in his grave. You look at the great leaders of the world. They live. They're on the world screen for a blip and they're gone. But the living Christ is alive. This is the message of Revelation, that we serve a risen Savior, and His power can be yours. His power can be mine, because He lives for us. The Jesus that died for us is the Jesus that lives for us. What is the message this special message that's go to the ends of the earth. It's the gospel. You remember what Matthew 24, verse 14 says? This gospel of the kingdom shall go to the ends of the earth as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. How can I find peace? I think of a young woman, a young attorney in Bulgaria, came to our meetings, accepted Christ. She found peace. I think of a thief in Moscow, scarred down his face, in and out of court 27 times. He came to our meetings, listened to messages like this. He found peace. I think of a young motorcycle gang leader in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, came in with his motorcycle gang to the meetings, and he found peace. I think of a young up-and-coming rock star came to our meetings, New Haven, Connecticut. He found peace. Yes, as we come to Jesus Christ, there is a new peace that flows into our life because the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, 6, is the answer to the great problems of humanity. This message, according to the Bible, is to go to the ends of the earth. It's a message that's to move this world with the Holy Spirit's power. It will lighten the earth with the glory of God. The Holy Spirit in the last days of earth's history will be poured out like it was in the book of Acts. Now, this message will reveal long neglected truths that will be restored. It will reveal truths that have been hidden down through the ages. The message in Revelation goes on, and it reveals an urgent end-time message of the gospel, parts of that biblical message that have been neglected. It's a message to call men and women to receive God's grace so powerfully in their lives that they obey God. The Bible says in Revelation 14, verse 7, fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Now, some people say that, that that's a little frightening. The Bible says, fear God. What does it mean to fear God? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. And there's an interesting word. You see where it says there, fear God? Their word is phoebo in Greek, and that means have the deepest respect, have the deepest awe, a respect for God that leads me to desire to do whatever He asks me to do. To fear God means not to tremble in fear in the sense of being afraid of an authoritarian dictator, but to fear God means to respect or reverence God by obeying God, that I have such respect for Him that all I want to do is what God wants me to do, that I have such reverence for Him, such awe for Him, such a sense that He will never ask me to do something that's not in harmony with my best good, that I fall at His feet and I say, God, all I want to do is what you want me to do. So fearing God and obedience are linked. They're linked through Scripture. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now, if you come to the wrong conclusion, you miss the whole point, right? So let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, that's reverence and respect Him. And how do I do that? And keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So there's a message in the book of Revelation 
that calls us who are saved by grace, calls all humanity everywhere to fear or respect God and live obedient, godly lives. Proverbs 3.1 says, My son, do not forget my law. Are people forgetting God's law today? Are we living in a society where men and women at times have turned their back on God's law because they feel God's law is restrictive? But yet God's law is the essence of freedom. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands, not only your head. What's the difference between having the law in our mind and the Lord in our heart? You can have the law of God in your head and simply try to keep it legalistically and ritually and fail again and again. You can know what God wants you to do, but when He puts it in your heart, you love to do it. When He puts it in your heart, you desire to do it. When He puts it in your heart, that's what you want. And so he's, God says, my son, don't forget my law. In other words, don't forget it out of your mind, but let your heart know that I'll do nothing that is not for your best good. Know, my children, that just like a father wants the best for his children, just like a father would never harm his children because he loves them, God says to you, let your heart keep my law recognize the beauty of my law, and by my Spirit, I will give you the strength to follow me. Revelation 14 verse 12 describes a people, a people that live in the last days of verse history. Here is the patience. Another word for patience is endurance of the saints. Saints are believers. Here are the endurance of my end time people. You say, where are God's people today? They have heard God's message. They've responded to the gospel. They've accepted His grace. They are redeemed by His love. They have reverential awe for Him. They want to obey Him. Here are those that do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, I thought if you were saved by grace through faith, you didn't have to keep the law. Grace does not lead you to disobey God. Grace leads you to obey God. Love does not lead you to be disobedient. Love leads you to be obedient. Here is an end time message, a message for all humanity, a message for every man, woman, and child living on the face of planet earth. Here is a call for those who have faith now, notice it doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says the faith of what? Faith of Jesus. They've accepted His grace, so the same quality of faith that was in Christ, the same quality of faith that guided His life, the same quality of faith that led Him to be dependent on the Father, that is living in end-time believers, and that faith is dynamic, that faith is powerful, and that faith leads them to keep the commandments of God, and they long to obey Him, not because it is some legalistic requirement, but because the living faith of Christ is in their life, and when you know Christ, you want to obey Christ. Now notice, fear God. Here's an end time message. Reverence God, respect God, let the faith of Christ live in your life and give glory to Him for the hour if His judgment has come. What does it mean to give glory to God? How do we give glory to God? Revelation's urgent end time message leads us not only to obey God, but it leads us to give glory to God. What does it mean to give glory to God? Let's ask the Bible to define what that means. Let's go to the Apostle Paul. To give glory to God means to honor Him in our lifestyle. It means to honor Him in the things we take into our bodies. It means to honor Him in the things we look at and see. It means to honor Him or give glory to Him in the things we hear, the music we listen to. It means to give glory to Him in the things that we watch on television, the places we go, the lifestyle that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is everything you do to the glory of God? Can you take a cigarette and put it in your mouth and smoke it and destroy your body to the glory of God? Can you take alcohol and just imbibe of it to the glory of God? Can you treat your body like a fun house and eat whatever you want and say that's to the glory of God? Certainly not. What does the Bible say? Therefore, Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to what? The glory of God. 
we desire to keep this created habitation that God has given us to His glory. I remember one time I was helping a lady quit smoking. She was an older grandma, and she had been smoking for about 40 years, and she could not quit everything we did. One day I went to visit her, and she said, Pastor Mark, guess what? I quit smoking. She said, I said, how did you quit smoking? She said, well, I had this one thought. Every time I took a puff of cigarette, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I committed my life to Jesus, but, but I never could quit smoking. But then I had this thought, if I'm a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within me. If I'm a Christian, I'm the temple of God. If I'm a Christian and I take a drag on a cigarette, Pastor Mark, I may be choking the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do that. I quit. Once you recognize your body as the temple of God, what do you want to do? You want to give glory to God. So here's a message, an end time message. A message of the gospel of God's grace. A message of His love and mercy. A message that goes to the ends of the earth. Here's an end time message that calls those of us who are saved by grace to obey God and keep His commandments. Here's an end time message. A message that echoes the message of the New Testament that has been lost sight of down through the ages. Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I beseech, I urge you, I appeal to you, therefore brethren, by the mercies of God that you present, notice you present, that is you choose, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see where it says your reasonable service? The Phillips translation of the Bible puts it this way, which is an act of worship. So when we come to God and say, God, I'm not going to take anything into my body that defiles it. We really enter into an act of worship because we're presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to Him. This is not salvation by diet. It is not salvation by works. It is rather the response of a heart of love that wants only to glorify God in the bodies that He's given us. Can you see why in the last days of earth's history that God is sending a message to a final generation on planet earth because this world often is defiling their bodies with the things they take in, defiling their minds with the things that they watch, defiling their whole beings by the places of entertainment that they go. So here is an end time message that says, fear God, give glory to Him, live in harmony with the marvelous laws of health that He has given you. An end time message of physical, mental, spiritual, emotional health to prepare a people for the coming of Jesus. Now notice Revelation 14, 7, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Of all the things that God has made or created, what's the most marvelous? What's the most amazing of all the things God has made? What is it? The human body. Can I worship Him, worship the Creator, by tearing down what He has made? If I want to worship the Creator, I want to work in harmony with what Jesus Christ has made. I don't want to tear down what He's made. But notice what it says, worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. In other words, worship the Creator. Now, who is this a message calling us to worship? It's a message calling us to worship the Creator, the Creator of heaven and earth. Throughout the book of Revelation, there is this appeal to worship the Creator. Can there be anything more meaningful than worshiping the Creator in an age of evolution? In an age where people believe that through fortuitous chance, that some kind of inanimate sub substance in the ocean came together and over millions of years they understand that that formed some kind of life form and then that life form over millions of years began to progress and down through those millenniums it eventually evolved into humanity. That's what many people believe. They believe given enough time and given the right circumstances through some kind of biological accident. Here, the majority of the world today, in the majority of the scientific community, and in the majority of the universities of the world today, the evolutionary hypothesis is taught. And in end time, 
God has a message in the Bible calling men and women back to the Creator. We are not merely a random collection of genes and chromosomes that came together. We are created by a living God. That's why we have purpose. That's why we have meaning. When God created you, He threw away the pattern. There's nobody else like you in the universe. That's why you have meaning and purpose in God's sight. In an age of evolution, God is a message, an end-time message to call men and women back to worshiping Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. From the minutest atom to the grandest galaxy, all nature calls us to worship our loving Creator. The very basis of worship is the fact that God created us. We did not evolve. We're not skin covering bones. We're not some genetic accident. Here, Revelation 4 verse 11, you are worthy. Why is He worthy? O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. God has left an eternal sign of His creative authority. It's called the Bible Sabbath. And in a future presentation here in Revelation's ancient discoveries, we're going to study that. God has an end-time message. It's to go to the ends of the earth. People saved by grace will be led to obey God. They will led, be led to desire one thing, to glorify God in their bodies. God is getting a people ready for His soon return. Now, in the book of Revelation, there are two worships, worshiping the Creator in Revelation 14, verse 7, and worshiping the beast in Revelation 14, 9. We will, in this study, of course, eventually study about who is the beast, what is the mark, and what is the way to avoid receiving the mark of the beast. But it's critically important in this telecast, this presentation, to understand that the essence of the book of Revelation and the conflict in the book of Revelation is about worship, worshiping the Creator or worshiping the beast. The Bible says, here's an urgent end-time message, obey God, glorify God, worship God. Now, the first angel's message tells us what we're supposed to be doing. It tells us that the gospel is going to go to the end of the earth and that we are to worship God. It tells us why we're supposed to do it. He created us. He made us. He shaped us. And it also tells us why it's so vitally important. Fear God, obey God, give glory to God. For the hour of His judgment, what are the next two words? Has come. Does it say they will come sometime in the future? No, it says the hour of God's judgment has come. In other words, the clock has struck the hour. In other words, this is no longer business as usual. This is no longer pleasures as usual. This is no longer common business. We are living on the knife edge of eternity. Before Jesus returns to this world, there must be a judgment to, to determine who receives what rewards when He comes. Remember Jesus says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is what? With me. Where is His reward? With me, He says. If Jesus is coming to give out the rewards, there must be a judgment before He comes to determine who receives what rewards when He comes. So, Revelation's message stimulates us out of our complacency. Revelation's message shakes us up. It says we're living in the judgment hour. This is time to get ready for the coming of Jesus. The hour of God's judgment has come. The sands in the hourglass of time indeed are running out. Revelation is a book about eternal choices. Revelation is a book about eternal destiny. Revelation is a book that compels us to make eternal decisions. We no longer can be neutral. Revelation gets us off the fence and moves us to decision for Christ. Jesus says in Revelation 22 verse 12, and behold, I'm coming when? Quickly. My reward is where? With me. To give who? Every man according to his work. Jesus says, I'm coming to give out the rewards. This is the judgment hour right now. Verse, Revelation 16, verse 7, 
Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments in this world. Often, very, very often, things that are unjust happen. But one day Christ is going to come. And in the final judgment before His coming, He will set all things right. And Jesus will triumph in the universe. He is the righteous judge. Sometimes in this life we experience things that are unfair. Sometimes in this life we experience things that are unjust. But the good news is He will set everything right. In that final judgment, He'll explain to us, in fact, just why certain things happen to us in life. He'll explain to us all of our heartache and every tear, but He'll explain to us how He was with us during those period of time. When Christ comes, according to Revelation 22, verse 12, He who is unjust, let Him be what? Unjust still. He who is filthy, let Him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let Him be righteous still. He who is holy, let Him be holy still. Now in this judgment hour, Christ gives us the opportunity to make a choice because when He comes again, there is no second opportunity. When Jesus comes again, the destinies of all human beings are settled. This is the time to make eternal decisions for Christ. This is the time when God's final urgent message is going to the ends of the earth to make decisions for Christ. Now, the first, there are three angels that bring their messages. The message of the first angel is a call to accept the everlasting gospel. The message of the first angel is a call to lovingly obey Christ and say, Jesus, all I want to know is what you want me to do. The message of the first angel is a call to give glory to God in every aspect of our lives. The message of the first angel is a call to worship our loving Creator and live in harmony with the commands of that Creator. The message of the first angel is a call, an urgent call, to live godly lives in the light of earth's final judgment. But a second angel flies, and the second angel flies, and truth and error are exposed. This world is filled with religious falsehood. So, Revelation 14:8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, that great city. Notice the first four letters in the word Babylon. They're baby. Why do you call a baby a baby? You call a baby a baby because its speech is garbled or confused. So Babylon in Revelation, and we'll study more about this in this series, Babylon in Revelation represents a confused religious system based on the traditions of man rather than the clear teachings of God's Word. God, in His Word, gives us the truth of Scripture. Now, notice what Babylon, this false religious system, has done. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In other words, she's passed around the wine cup of her false doctrines. The world has become drunk with the false doctrines of Babylon. And what does Jesus say? He says, I want to sober you up with the truth of my word. Jer John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is what? Truth. So in the last days of earth's history, the errors of Babylon, the false teachings, the deceptive teachings will be exposed by the truth of God's Word as the message of the three angels goes to the ends of the earth. But then the third angel flies, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Before that third angel flies, I want to review the first angel's message again to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying, fear God, give glory to Him. This message shakes up Babylon, a message of the gospel, a message of dependence on Christ, a message to obey God reverentially, a message to give glory to God, a message that the hour of God's judgment has come, a message to worship Him as Creator. Now notice, true worship is mentioned in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Worship the Creator that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. Now we go to the third angel. Look, here's false worship. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a, what kind of voice? If the Bible says it with a loud voice, why? Because God wants you to hear it. 
God wants you to hear it. If anyone worships the what? Beast. What did we read about in Revelation 14, 7? Worship the what? Creator. Revelation 14, 9, don't worship the, the beast. See, here's the conflict in Revelation between true and false worship. If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, the wrath of God of the judgments of God. So, two worships in Revelation. Now, what about those that don't receive the mark of the beast but do worship the Creator? Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints, here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We could summarize it this way. Revelation 14, 7 says, worship the what? Creator. Revelation 14, 9 says, don't worship the what? Beast. Revelation 14, 12 says, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Is there one commandment of the ten that talks about worshiping the Creator? Is that, is there one? The Sabbath commandment. So here, true and false worship contrasted and a message to all humanity to worship the Creator by worshiping on the true Bible Sabbath. God's last day message warns us against the devil's deceptions in the last days. It calls us to true worship. It's an appeal to surrender completely our lives to God and to commit our lives to following Him. Some time ago, a young boy was hit by a car, and there crossing the street, he was dying, losing blood, rushed to the hospital. They looked for a blood donor, and they found the father had the same blood type as the boy. These were the days of direct blood transfusions. They took a needle, pressed it in the arm of the father. Blood began to flow from the father directly to the boy. The father looked at the lifeless form of his son, and he looked at the doctor, and he said, Doctor, if you need to, take it all. Take every drop of my blood. That father was willing to give his all for his son. On Calvary's cross, Jesus gave his all for you because he wants you to be ready for his soon return. There's nothing more that he wants than you to be ready. If Jesus gave his all for me, I want to give my all to him. What do you say? Because one day soon he will come. One day soon the earth will quake. One day soon Jesus will return. I think I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Listen as Celestine sings. I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet. The dead in Christ shall arise to meet him in the air. And then those that remain who will be quickly changed at the midnight cry. When Jesus comes again I look around me And I see prophecies Fulfilling And signs of the times They're appearing
the Father says I'm cooking all my children at the midnight cry. The bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And then those that remain who will be quickly changed. When Jesus comes again, when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to me. And he will, at the midnight cry, Jesus will come again. The only response is to say, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I want to serve you forever. Let's pray together. And in your heart, let the Spirit of God touch you to make that decision right now. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that Jesus is coming that through His grace and by His power we can live in His kingdom. Grant to us your strength to live godly, obedient lives and to follow your truth now and through all eternity. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. We'll continue in this series in our next presentation.